from the cream. What is up, freaks? Welcome back to Tales from the Crypt. It's your boy Marty Bent on a hot and humid Wednesday night in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. Sticky New York City in the summer. It's uh, it's one of those sticky, stinky nights. The trash is everywhere. I'm sick of the trash, John. I'm sick of it. You got to get out of the city, man. <laughs> I do on the weekends. I, I, I jet straight for the beach. Uh, as you freaks can hear him in the background, I have John Newberry with me from Chain Code Labs. John, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks, Marty. Good to be here. Chain Code, first two repeat guests, you and Matt Corallo. Matt, oh, Matt beat me. <laughs> <laughs> Prodigious Matt Corallo. <laughs> Just barely. Uh, um, and... I feel I feel spoiled having you two as the only two repeat guests up to this point. And J.W. Weatherman, he's been on again. Okay. I had to post his second episode, though. Well, it's an honor. <laughs> honor to be invited back. The honor is all mine. We are sipping on some rosé on this humid night. A crisp, crisp Rioja. Rioja. Very nice. Cheers. Cheers. And the Zadi La Rosa. Very crisp right now. Mm. Very refreshing. John uh, requested that we only do one bottle tonight, so I obliged... Um, so we're going to be tame. We'll, we'll get cosmic. Though. A, little <laughs> bit. a little bit cosmic. We'll definitely get cosmic. Um, yeah, reason I brought you back in here is last week you announced a uh, pretty amazing initiative, in my opinion, uh, to help the economic players in Bitcoin become more efficient and use block space more efficiently. Uh, the Bitcoin Operations Technology Group, or Bitcoin Optech, why don't you fill us in on what's going on there, sort of why you guys decided to get together and, and what you guys have done up to this point. Yeah, so us guys is me and James O'Byrne at Jane Code and Steve Lee out on the West Coast. Shout out, Steve. Shout out, Steve. Post Google, right? Ex-Google? Ex-Googler, yes. That's right. Product director at Google. Um, we want to help Bitcoin companies adopt better scaling technology and maybe encourage them a little bit to adopt better scanning technology. So the history the history here is, as you freaks all know, back at the end of last year, we had, uh, the price was mooning, we had a lot of activity on chain, mempool filled up, fees went through the roof, and that hurt a lot of people. And at the same time as that, a lot of the transactions on the network were not constructed efficiently. So there was room for batching, a lot of transactions weren't using SegWit, um, lots of small wins like that, and um, people got a little bit frustrated in places. There was definitely some friction between some of the, the companies in Bitcoin and, and some of the, mem- the members of the community, and we wanted to help somehow, um, or explore how we could help. Um, so the impetus came from Adam Back. He, he posted a blog post and, and sent an email to the mailing list. Which, which I'm a member of, suggesting that we have a grand scaling challenge to coordinate industry players to adopt scaling tech. And that was really, that really resonated with me. It's something that I, I'd already kind of been thinking about. And so I, I got back to Adam, talked to a few people, and probably in a, around March or April this year, started talking to companies about whether there was actually a need for this and what their pain points were and whether they thought something like this would be useful. Um, James O'Byrne was also very interested in helping, as was Steve Lee. And so after about two months of talking to companies and, and figuring out exactly what we would do, we've, we've launched Optech and um, we're, we're hoping we can do something useful in the industry. Yeah. I mean, you touched on the, uh, I don't want to say strife, but the the contention towards the end of last year when fees got got to an all-time high. I think at one point, average fees on a U.S. dollar basis was like $50 at some point in December when... They got high, yeah. I, yeah. I don't know the exact numbers, but um, that's unfortunate because it hurts it, it hurts individuals, it hurts businesses, and it, it prices some people out and some use cases out. Yeah, and that's actually... I was talking about it with somebody, I think it was last week... Uh, I did like a YouTube show with that Adam Meister guy. We were talking about it. Like we were talking about Bitcoin Optic. I think it was the day you guys announced um, last Friday. Or Friday, yeah. Yeah. And uh, saying like what what would have last December been like had, had this initiative been started like a year ago. So like a big problem. One of the big problems over December in particular was uh, that became known to the greater community because of uh, Laurent from o- OXT. 
he was able to identify that Coinbase, one of their wallets in particular, had a UTXO set of th- about $3 million at the time uh, that was unspendable because it was all dust. So you have one of the biggest economic players in the industry sort of not using, uh, they weren't uh, consolidating UXOs, UTXOs, excuse me, uh, efficiently. And it was actually like eye opening to me. It's like, how is Coinbase, one of the biggest players in this space, been around since 2011, 2012? How, how are they not able to, to efficiently use block space at this point? Like, how is that not like number one of their number one priorities? And it seems like it wasn't a priority for a while. And maybe, maybe that was the kick in the ass we needed was, was the high fees to get this going. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not a problem until it, it is a problem and then it's a big problem. Um, so not, not just Coinbase, a lot of companies did have very large wallets with lots of UTXOs. And that wasn't a problem for them when fees were once totally a byte. But then when fees spike up to 20 or 50 or 100, then suddenly it's too late to do anything about it. And at the same time, they're fighting fires, trying to onboard all the millions of customers who suddenly want to buy Bitcoin. Um, that's their priority. They need to make sure their backends are still working and scaling. So, yeah, it's, it's a good thing we're kind of in this quiet bear market right now because those companies can maybe take this time to look at their implementations and see where they can make efficiency gains now in preparation for whenever um, mempool fills up again and we see more transactions going through the system. Yeah, you uh, teased it in this week's newsletter that uh, Zappa is going to explain how they consolidate. Was it 4 million UTXOs or $4 million worth of UTXOs? Uh, 4 million UTXOs. <laughs> Holy crap. Zappo had a lot of UTXOs. Yep. Oh my God. And how like, did they consolidate that into one UTXO? Or like a... it's, it's ongoing. Um, yeah. So yeah, we, we, we teased it in this week's newsletter. Um, we have a, a short piece written by AJ Towns, who, who works at Zappo, um, just giving a, a bit of detail about what they did to consolidate. Um, and in the end, actually, it's it, it may turn out to be a good strategy to not consolidate until, you know, not consolidate previously because fees were very high. And now that fees are low, it's a good time to consolidate. So um, it, it's great now that fees are low. We're seeing quite a lot of large companies consolidate and the, the UTXO set has gone down massively mm-hmm. this year. And consolidating UTXOs is only one way that you can uh gain efficiencies, correct? So yeah, so so consolidating UTXOs is great for the network because the UTXO set is the critical data that four nodes are storing. Um, four nodes are processing the entire blockchain, but they can prune away old data, What's what, what they need to keep and what they need to keep in, in fast access memory if they want to keep up with the tip is the UTXO set. So whenever that goes down, that's great for the health of the network. But in terms of more efficient use in general, um, a big win would be batching. So for these large economic players that are using maybe percent, units of percent or tens of percent of the the transaction throughput of the network, if they were batching, then we'd see a huge win in terms of the amount of economic activity and payments we could get through the system. So what does it mean when you're when you say batching for, for the freaks out there? For the freaks out there. Um, and for me. <laughs> <laughs> so if, if we think, um, okay, let's imagine I'm, I'm a service and I want to send out 100 payments to 100 individuals. If I had a very naive implementation of that, I would construct a transaction that's sent out to um, recipient number one and return some change to me. So Bitcoin is a UTXO model. Every time you send out a transaction, if, if you have, if your UTXOs that you use to input to the transaction um, overshoot what you're trying to pay, you create a change UTXO going back to yourself. So you'd create one, one transaction going to um, recipient number one with change coming back to you. You'd then create a second transaction, maybe using that change and sending it to recipient two with its own change coming back to you and so on, and you'd have this series of 100 transactions which might have one or two inputs, but they'd all have two outputs because you're, you're chaining along that change. Um, each time you create that change output, you add one UTXO, and then each time you spend it, you remove that UTXO and add a signature, and that signature needs to be validated by every full node on the network. So you're, you're creating this, this very big set of data. If instead of doing that, 
you batch your transactions, so you just create one large transaction with 100 outputs going to your recipients and then maybe one change output to yourself. Um, that's a lot smaller on the chain, a lot, lot smaller in terms of the data that's going over the network and is being stored on the blockchain. And it's cheaper to validate because you're doing, um, you're checking a lot fewer signatures. So it's good for you, it's good for the network and you save a lot of space and you save fees. And that's, that's one thing. Like, I mean, that's been going on. The debate has been going on since Satoshi Dice. Like, obviously, there's no such thing as spam, some people would say. But we should try as hard to, uh, to incentivize, I don't want to say incentivize, but entice these big economic players to be as efficient as possible. And Yeah, it, well, Bitcoin must be incentive comp compatible. Right? Mm -hmm. it, it, it fails if it's not. So... In the long run, yes, these large actors should be naturally incentivized to do these things. Um, but maybe there are obstacles between where they are now and actually implementing them. And if Optech can help remove some of those obstacles, and so those players just need to step forward and do it, then that can only be a good thing, I think. Yeah, and how do you guys plan about going uh, evangelizing this message? Um, well, we, we talk to companies. Um, we've, we've reached out to 20 plus companies now and had initial conversations with, with, with all of those companies just to try and understand how they're actually using Bitcoin and how they're using the blockchain. And that's eye-opening. Um, we want to understand what their pain points are and, and why they haven't implemented SegWit, for example, if they haven't, or why they're not doing batching. And understand those problems. Um, think about you know, the trade-offs that they're, they're thinking about and maybe um, give them information around why it might be a good idea to do batching or SegWit. Um, in terms of concrete activities, we, we have our weekly newsletter, so we're trying to you know, spread knowledge about what's going on right now in Bitcoin in terms of technology you can use today and implement today. We had our first workshop in San Francisco last week on Tuesday, and we had a bunch of Bay Area companies come and talk about RBF and CPFP and coin selection and general communication with the open source community. So we're, we're hoping to do more of those workshops and we're hoping to produce documentation around things like batching or RBF CPFP or, you know, it, if Lightning continues to mature and it, it seems like it's ready for these large economic players to adopt Lightning, maybe documentation about integrating Lightning into their existing systems, maybe documentation about Schnorr signatures if those come along. So that kind of thing. Um, documentation, face-to-face -face meetings. We've got an online forum for, for engineers to kind of exchange ideas. A, a bunch of things. Is the documentation on GitHub just open source? I can check it out, whatever. Yeah, so everything we produce will be in the public domain. Um, we haven't produced it yet, but that is what we will be doing. Um, this is going to come off as you freaks are probably going to think I'm lying, but believe it or not, uh, earlier this year, probably like February, March, I was meeting up with this guy, Eric Spano. He's actually, um, he's responsible for starting bills.com, which Francis Paulette now runs. Oh yes. Uh, Francis just left. Oh no. He left. He, he left Catalaxy and his net. Yes. To yes, go, yes, yes. To go flat. I don't know if it's bills or it might be bills. I'm not sure what it is. Yeah. Regardless, not important to the story. The, the original founder, Eric, who handed it off to Francis, I don't know what Francis is doing with it now, but we would meet up and we had similar conversations like, hey, there's got to be uh, a way for, like, there's got to be, like, what you're doing right now with the GitHub uh, uh, instru instructions or... Scaling cookbook, we're calling it. Exactly, but, scaling yeah. cookbook. Like, that That needs to, like, get in the hands of, like, block explorers, uh exchanges economic economic uh actors in the space and we we actually were focusing on block explorers like if you're a block explorer like here's what you should show and explain to users like what they're looking at because if you go to blockchain.info or now blockchain.com uh it's not it's not as easy to read their their block explorer as uh, as it should be yeah and and ux is a, a big part of this so one possible arguments against batching is 
our customers are used to seeing a transaction with one output for them. And so if they start seeing transactions with hundreds of outputs, they'll be confused. Um, so you know, p part of what we do, or part of what we hope to do, is understand best practices around UX as well as around the technology and you know, help spread those. No, it's uh, funny seeing the UX, because uh, I've got a little bit of a UX background myself, um, the UX community and the development community within cryptocurrency sort of coming together more, more intently now. I can tell that a designer did not make the BitcoinOps.org site. Um, nope. <laughs> <laughs> nope. It's, it's functional, <laughs> and it presents the information required, and uh, our priorities are not to make a pretty website. But, but PRs are welcome, so any of you UX guys out there who want to contribute to our web website, please open a PR. No, but that's, um, that's actually, I had an interesting co uh, conversation with... Uh, with Richard Burton from Balance.io, he's working on uh, well-designed wallets for the Ethereum community and to hold their tokens. While I, I don't agree with uh, that project and or not Balance, but Ethereum in general, I do think uh, what Richard is doing from a UX perspective is very uh, very needed. And, and we are I think we're getting to the point where uh, m there might be more consumer-facing apps, and UX is going to be a very important part of that. One app that just got teased a couple of days ago was uh, Jack Mahler's uh, Zap app. Did you did you check that out at all? I, I haven't looked at it yet, but I, I saw I saw he's been tweeting about it. Apparently, like, you're going to be able to just run Lightning on an iOS app. Uh, I think there's some degree of uh, trust involved where you have to trust. Uh, there's going to be Lightning nodes that you sort of have to trust while you're using it on your phone. But um, very interesting that you'll be able to go. Pay for co pay for coffee with Bitcoin uh, using the Lightning Network. Great, because he's got a he's also got a a merchant app. Um, and what's very interesting is that he's testing it with marijuana companies in legal states: Denver, California, Oregon, Washington State. I believe uh, that obviously they have problems getting bank accounts, so they hold yeah. all their marijuana profits in cash in vaults, and they have they have to have Brinks guards come come move their money around. So he's actually helping them um, avoid that, where they can they can accept Bitcoin instead. It's a glorious thing, right? It's God, God bless you, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Lightning Network. Let's dive in while we're on the topic. Mm. Like, what do you think? It's been it's been growing exponentially over the last last couple months. Mm -hmm. I think I think beginning of June it was at like twenty one Bitcoin, and now I think I saw today somebody was saying we're about to hit uh, over a million dollars of cumulative. Uh, cumulative uh, money within the network reckless <laughs> <laughs> what? it's reckless <laughs> it's, these reckless kids with their channels uh, it's great it's great um i i'm very excited uh, the thing i was most excited about in the last couple of months was satoshi's place obviously because it's <laughs> amazing uh that was uh we pulled that up at the last bit devs meeting and there was a couple of uh inappropriate images on there john i did not want to see that in public <laughs> uncensorable inappropriate images uh i think uh i think ethereum just copied that too you can do it on ethereum now too very unoriginal though really yeah there's uh you can do it with a gui or whatever their their satoshi level uh denomination is on, on a in a channel in a in a state channel or? i'm not positive okay i'm not positive okay. um but uh never never really original on that end always copying I don't think that's fair, Marty. I think uh, Ethereum has done a great job at recruiting application developers, and they've done a great job at supporting those application developers, and there have been a lot of applications. I would like to see that replicated in Bitcoin. I think we can have really cool applications on Bitcoin as well. How so? How do we get there? Lightning, of course. Yeah. We, we have more things like Satoshi's Place, and... Uh, Lightning is, is a far better model for that kind of application, in my mind, than Ethereum, which I don't think scales. Um, the, the things you can compare there are CryptoKitties and Satoshi's Place. And CryptoKitties is a, a fun game on top, of a, on top of a blockchain. And it basically brought Ethereum to a halt because all of that data was going onto the public blockchain. Satoshi's Place had had far more activity, I believe, in terms of transactions, but 
they were all off chain and the Bitcoin blockchain didn't care. No, <laughs> no one, no one even needed to know. And that, for me, that's a, that's a really kind of concrete proof point that this is the way you build applications on top of a blockchain. And what do you think needs to happen before like we, uh, like the, the dam is broken and like, uh, developers are able to flood in mass the lightning. Do you think, uh, more sort of developer kits need to be developed to uh, libraries, different languages, different implementations. What are, what are you looking for? Um, yeah, all of those things, just more widespread and diffuse knowledge about building applications on top of lightning. So people like Alex Bosworth, who is doing just an incredible job. Is he, has he been a guest yet? Not yet. I need to get him on. You need to get him on. Whenever he's, he comes through, Alex, whenever you come through New York, hit me up. Yeah. He's, he's doing wonderful work and he's just a, a fount of ideas and cool projects of things to do on top of Lightning. So, you know, him spreading those ideas, people picking them up, Lightning becoming more mature because it's still beta and there are still issues. It, it'll happen, I think. Yeah. It's like the other thing. So Alex uh, played part in an experiment to sort of derive... Uh, a lightning network interest rate. Um, I don't know if you've seen that, uh, Nick. Yep. Uh, Batia. Yep. Doing a time, at time value of BTC on Twitter. He's been writing some pretty interesting pieces and uh, about deriving interest rates from lightning network activity, basically seeing how many fees people accrue over a certain amount of time. Um, and he's basically saying that depending on how good of a router you are, you can, you can earn Diff, like better interest rates depending on how how much uh, economic activity you facilitate and stuff like that cool. which has been amazing to see and uh, the one thing that he will even say is that these are very early day conversations but I'm happy to see that these conversations are even happening like we're thinking about talking about how we would build build capital market structures on top of Bitcoin actually, at the end of the day yep. and that's I mean that's what let's get a little bit cosmic that's what this is all about <laughs> like we are literally uh, building the tools that allow us to push off the dock and, and, and sail away from the traditional finance system. I don't think it's going to happen any time in the next five or six years, but maybe a decade, two. Yeah. So how, how long did that take for us to get Cosmic? Uh, we are 22 in minutes and 40 seconds in. Great. I love it. I love <laughs> it when we get Cosmic. <laughs> um, yeah, we're... If if this all works the way we hope it will work, we're building a new economy, and it's it's fascinating to see it in its nascent stage, and people thinking about these things and wondering where it will go. Yeah, I uh, I mean, think, just thinking back to our last conversation in November, like how much has changed since then? Like, I feel like I feel like we've gone through like five years. Of, of earth time in, mm. in seven, eight months. Um, I don't want to benchmark it to them, but like up to this point, like how has the network or the activity and the development on the network progressed versus your expectations up to this point? Bitcoin in general or lightning? Both. Um, I, I don't keep that close an eye on day-to-day -day changes in lightning, but um, you know, I, I know the, the three clients are all maturing and we're all... We're, we threw alpha into beta for all of those clients and we're seeing more channels and bigger channels and more cool experiments like Satoshi's Place. So that's that's great. It's going, you know, it's going ahead as planned, but it still sucks a bit. You know? <laughs> it's, sometimes I think Sea Lightning stops talking to LND, stops talking to Assange. So yeah, we still have a ways to go. Bitcoin continues. Bitcoin abides and is <laughs> 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 it's, it's doing exactly what it's supposed to do. Um, Bitcoin Core is continuing and, I, in my opinion, continuing to write great software and um, release great software. So that's that's all really cool. Um, in terms of future direction, I think probably when we spoke, Taproot and Graftroot hadn't even been proposed or talked about no so that's all very exciting um peter wooler released his bit proposal 
10 days or two weeks ago about Schnorr signatures. So that's progressing. So let's let's jump into Schnorr signatures. So this is, I brought up this chart on Bitcoin visuals. You freaks can't see it, but John can see it in here. So like, if you can see where I'm looking at, we're looking at um, chain size. So like the, the growth of chain size, like Bitcoin, obviously, you want it to be decentralized, so you want the chain growing at a slower rate. It looks like there's a noticeable, I don't know if it's SegWit adoption or whatever it is, but around uh, February, late February, early March, there's a considerable sort of uh, trajectory change in a good way of the, the chain size growth. So it looks like the growth rate is slowing down. You can see that in the blue line here. Growth rate uh, beginning at... You know, July 2013, so five years ago, is around like 85% uh, growth a year, uh, which at that state is not that much, or is, I mean, the chain wasn't that big then, so it didn't take much to grow 85%, but right now, it's growing at like an annual rate of like 25 to 30% a year, so the amount of data getting out to the Bitcoin blockchain in particular, it seems like it's trending toward, it, you can tell it's becoming more efficient, which is which is a huge sign and good for decentralization. And so I would assume that this is this sort of like change in trajectory was due to SegWit. And I'm interested to get your thoughts on how Schnorr would affect something like this because it creates a huge efficiency gain when you're sending uh, multiple, you're sending from multiple wallets to one wallet, correct? Or um, you're... Set, you're condensing multiple transactions into one wallet, excuse me. So the initial, um, the first step is simply to add Schnorr. And by itself, Schnorr does some cool things. Um, it reduces the size of the signature from 72 or 73 bytes down to 64. Um, that's, that's not actually Schnorr. That's just the encoding that Peter has proposed in his BIP. Uh, because the encoding we use for ECDSA is needlessly inefficient. So that's that's good. It reduces its signature size down a little bit. Um, the other thing that you immediately get from Schnorr is multi-sig becomes the size of a single signature. So that's, that's great. Um, what you're talking about, I think, is aggregating signatures across inputs for a transaction? Yes. Okay. So that wouldn't come with the initial... Out, rolled out of Schnorr. That's something that is possible, but is probably too much to bite off at this point. Okay. Um, and if you really want to go into the details, you should watch the San Francisco Bitcoin mm -hmm. meetup talk by Peter Waller. Yeah, that's last what I was Monday. referencing because yeah. I watched that. I, I read about that in the newsletter on Monday. And that's like where I got that question from. Yeah. So that's something that could happen in future. But um, first of all, we need Schnorr. Uh, and I think. Um, f from my listening of, of Peter's talk, a sensible initial soft fork would be just Schnorr plus Taproot, maybe. So we wouldn't get that transaction signature aggregation, but it's something that you could use Schnorr for in future. Mm -hmm. And so let's jump into Taproot then. So how, what does is, what is the addition of Taproot do? Oof, okay. Um, so Taproot is a scheme where you create a transaction output that can either be spent with a signature in the best case and that signature could be a multi-sig where everyone signs or it's spent with a script and that script is revealed through um, an adapter signature on the initial commitment um, it's quite difficult for me to explain at this point. <laughs> John literally had to close his eyes and visualize what he was thinking to, to um, explain this. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the, the really... Okay, I'll, I'll try and explain it like a black box. That the, the nice thing about Taproot is in the general case, and the general case would be like 99% of the time, um, whatever the encumbrance is on your output, so whatever the conditions of spend are, you can just get everyone to agree that that condition has been fulfilled and they sign a multi-sig and it just looks like a single signature on the blockchain. So that's really good for scalability because um, just validating a single signature is great. It's really good for privacy because um, you never need to reveal your script. And well, those are, the, those are the good things. If you have a condition where not everyone agrees and not everyone signs this multi-sig, you then 
reveal a script which is just an adaptation is revealed by an adaptation of the signature and so before it gets spent everything looks the same in the majority of cases everything looks the same but in that small case where not everyone signs the multi-sig you just reveal this this kind of tweet signature plus the script plus the conditions on that script um, so it's it, it's really good for privacy and scalability basically and that was maybe not very clear but I got it. Okay. I got what you're saying. Okay, good. And I mean, this is huge because in my opinion, others others would uh debate this, but I think uh some of the biggest competitors to Bitcoin are the A non coins that are they're basically fighting Bitcoin on its fungibility characteristics and I think things like Schnorr and Tap Taproot, like if they become a thing will sort of blow that uh will sort of weaken that that competitive the competitiveness of coins like Monero and Zcash and stuff like that. Maybe I mean those those, those coins have different privacy characteristics, mm-hmm. um, but anything that improves fungibility in Bitcoin is is really really important because if you don't have fungibility, you don't have a money. You you know you have something which isn't money. You have an Orwellian system basically. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's one thing everybody has to be aware of. Like, hey, Bitcoin is not as fungible as it can be, or nor should be at this point. But things like Schnorr and Taproot are on the way, and then Lightning Network also adds another layer of privacy as well. Yep, privacy. I'm going to say privacy. 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 You like that? <laughs> uh, do you think getting Schnorr and Taproot implemented will be as hard as getting Segwit implemented? No. No. I'm going <laughs> to. I'm going to say no. Um, I, I can't tell the future, but I think not. Um, I think a lot of the people who might oppose it are now using an altcoin called BCH. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, thank you for they, using the politically correct term uh, of BCH. Yeah, neutral. Um, I, I, don't, I hope not. I, I think there's such clear wins that it's difficult to see a reason why one would oppose adding Schnorr and Taproot, but you don't know. Do you think it'll start out like a BIP9 activation type vote? Um, I I don't know. I wouldn't use the word vote. (laughs) Uh, BIP9 is a a coordination mechanism for miners to signal that they are ready for for a protocol change. Um, Maybe, I don't know. I'm I'm not in charge, but... But I, I think uh, like what you and James and, Cr- and Steve and crew are doing at Bitcoin Optech is actually huge for making this happen because you're basically extending an olive branch to a lot of the companies that were pro Segwit 2x last year, and, and so there was a lot of like you guys are helping mend wounds from the civil war of 2017. May peace prevail. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I enjoyed that in uh, in your newsletter, Marcy. May <laughs> peace prevail. I hope so. I mean, I that's. I think that's a better approach that we try and work together and improve the system. Um, we, we'll see if it if it's fruitful, but I hope it will be. I think it will be. I'm com- I'm I'm confident uh, because it's such a no brainer, and again, this is all. This is all a network f- effect and a feedback loop, and if everybody's on the same page, it just makes the feedback loop that much stronger, and the network's effects that much stronger, and the confidence in the network that much stronger, which makes Bitcoin more likely to succeed. Um, yeah, and and what's good for Bitcoin is good for everyone using Bitcoin. So exactly. Hopefully, hopefully we'll get Schnorr and Taproot in, maybe next year if we hurry. And then companies can start using it, and we we all can start using it. That would be a a wonderful thing. All right, let's get cosmic. Okay, let's, let's get go. heavy. Let's go. Uh, Bank of Canada this week uh, released a paper that says they think Bitcoin has passed the threshold at which it is not susceptible to a fifty one percent attack and is unlikely to be attacked by a nation state. Who said that? Bank of Canada. Bank of Canada. Mm. The Bank of Canada. Francis Paulette po- uh, posted a lot about this. Okay. Um, it seems as though people aren't talking enough about this, but if that is true, like, 
and Bitcoin is a self-sustaining network. Where I mean, the hash rate on the network alone is where is it like 40, 40 exa hash a second right now? Forty-two. Yeah, it's a forty-two exa hash a second. It that's has, guys, <laughs> <laughs> listeners at home. If you don't already realize, 42 is a lot of exahashes. Can, we, can you explain that? Can you explain the gravity of how, how secure the network is? Yeah, for, 40 is not quite enough, but 42 is just <laughs> spot on. But what does that mean? Like, So what, where was it this time last year? All right, let's find July 24th, 2017. It was at 6 exahash. Pathetic. 6, six exahash. 6. We've gone 7x in 12 months yeah so what took what took eight and a half years or eight eight almost nine years or no eight and a half years to get go from zero to six it took one year to go from six to 42 that's some crazy growth that's yeah that's parabolic are you confident enough to say that like the bitcoin bitcoin from a hash power perspective is uh, sort of protected from outside outside attacks. I'm going to say no. No? No. Why is this? Um, I think we still have a long way to go on minor decentralization and mm. combating those centralization pressures. Well, that's why I got lunch with Matt yesterday and we talked this this is all we talked about okay. it's better hash and, and how to make it a thing because I really want to make it a thing but it's you need a lot of hash power out of the gate to yep. to get it working so Matt was saying like if you want a, a viable pool to make this happen you probably need 5% of hashing power out of the gate okay that's and that's like on par with F2 pool which has like 6.2% which is one of the bigger pools um, in the world so this is, I'm going to use this as, as a, so that, and I did the math on that. It's probably like 200, I didn't do the math. Somebody else did the math for me. It's probably like around 270 megawatts of energy. That's a lot of energy. Okay. Um, Guy, guys at home, 270 <laughs> megawatts. That, <laughs> that's a lot of energy. A lot of energy. But uh, Matt and I, we basically came to the conclusion that you're, we're going to need a coalition of mining farms to sort of like drop guard and say hey let's just get together who cares who the pool operator is let's let's create a joint venture or something and just get this off the ground do you think something like that is needed to get better hash off the ground do you think better hash is needed to decentralize mining or do you think it, it could be decentralized in another way no i think better hash is definitely the way forward or a one thing that we need to do um i have not spent any time looking at minor economics, um, unlike Matt, who thinks about it a lot. So I, I don't know. Five percent seems like a lot of the network. Um, it, you, you're saying that anything less than five percent is unviable as a pool. Uh, I don't want to say unviable, maybe unprofitable, because um, I think he said the variance of payouts is, is a problem up until that point. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Um, five seems like a lot. Maybe, maybe next time you have Matt on for for the third time, appearance we'll be the first number three. Third, third, three peat will be the first three peat guest. Yeah, um, I don't know. It's it, it's a thorny problem, like introducing a new mining protocol because you have a chicken and egg problem. That exactly, yeah. you, the incumbents don't want to do it because it's, it's a they have a huge sunk cost in the protocol they're already using, and then again. To make it viable for for newcomers, you need to sort of amass a certain amount of hash power. It's like, yeah, uh, yeah. how do we make that happen? But did you see what Bitmain did today? I did not. Bitmain said they're going to start open sourcing the algorithms that run on their miners that they're using in particular. Okay. John doesn't trust him. He's going to be like, <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't, I don't, I don't know what that means. I'm afraid. Yeah. So what? Why do you think? mining centralized right now you don't think it's sufficiently um i don't you know i don't think it's sufficiently decentralized and i worry that there are more pressures towards centralization than pressures towards decentralization what do you mean what are what are, what are the pressures towards centralization 
economies of scale. Economies so. of scale. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and especially around manufacturing, that mm-hmm. Bitmain is dominant and I don't see them. Well, all right. Well, let's get cosmic here. Imagine when you can 3D print your chips. What do you think? Do you think that'll ever happen? <laughs> <laughs> Imagine uh, if you can, you can. Imagine if you have a fab in your backyard, a, a chip <laughs> fabricator. <laughs> Some people seem to believe we'll be able to three D print up one day. But who prints the printers? Yeah, that's true. Let's get cosmic. That's another chicken and egg problem. <laughs> <laughs> I I don't know. Um, who knows? It's an experiment, and we are about nine and a half years into the experiment so let's let's see what happens are you more confident than you were in november um before or after 2x stopped that was after that was after that was after right when did 2x stop i mean august 1st was the user activated soft fork and then uh uh it might have been early in mid-december actually because they had like a three-month period where they thought they were going to fork September, October. Did we talk yeah, about the one-off problem? I think we might have talked about the one-off problem on the first. One. No, problem. I don't think so. The one-off problem <laughs> where the two X, the two X, they they uh, they didn't fork because because of the one-off pro- problem. They were one block away. They were. They were so close. <laughs> <laughs> um, did we talk about that? Wow, it's ancient history now. Right. Um, it seems like years ago. I I am more confident. I was more confident after two X was abandoned um, because I think that was a very strong signal for Bitcoin decentralization and the market responded appropriately and went up, but now it's gone down. So maybe we can't read too much into that. Well, send it back up this week, but I'm not going to get my hopes up. Could be a bull trap. Who knows? Uh, But there is, it's hard to say. It's hard to say. There's a lot of ETF approval rumors going out there. I'm not so confident that an ETF is going to get approved this go around, but it would be ultra bullish if it did. Yeah. Um, but again, like th- that's not really, that's not really what I'm looking at. What I'm more worried about is the hash rate and the hash rate is growing exponentially. 42 guys, 42 <laughs> exa hashes. 42 exa. <laughs> like who, who would have thought this time last year? <laughs> right? <laughs> Seven times where it was. And actually let's get into this. I don't think I've talked about this with anybody on this podcast yet, but did you see, there was a mining facility, so you can see this drop in hash rate here. Uh, oh like yeah, that was a good one last month. Yeah, uh, it that. actually it caused a difficulty, uh, a downward difficulty adjustment. But apparently, like a huge mining farm in China got like blown out by a flood. Yeah, and it it there was like a considerable amount of not a cons- I mean a noticeable amount of a material amount of hash rate left in the network because of this. Um, yeah, it went down maybe ten percent. Yeah, over the short run, and then recovered in in fairly short order. Yeah, but if it was a flood, and it's kind of difficult to parse out cause for things like this, if it was the flood, that that flood is now immutably stamped in the blockchain <laughs> for the rest of history. Well, that and it sort of drives your point home that we need to further geographically decentralize this stuff. Because imagine if, let's say, even fifty percent of the miners are in China. Who knows? Could be that high. Could be higher. Yep. Uh, Chinese government one day just shows up to all their doors and unplugs their their machines. Like, like it's not. A, I mean, if if it's fifty percent, that's not really a problem. We have twenty minute blocks for a period of up to four weeks, and then difficulty adjusts down, and we we go on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and yeah, and then well, and then miners in other parts of the world say, "Oh my God, difficulty is about to drop down. Uh, let's yeah. plug some miners in. Let's plug those S sevens in." It's a living org. Is Bitcoin a living organism? And are we are we sustaining it? <laughs> Do we control Bitcoin? Do we? Or oh, does it control oh, us? <laughs> good, good. Okay, how far how far are we in now? Because we're forty four minutes. 40 into, minutes. So every twenty two minutes. We're okay, getting, we, uh, we're getting we, cosmic. We get it off a cosmic <laughs> notch. Yeah, good. That's one of my. I mean, Ralph C. Merkel. He's he's said that Bitcoin is basically a living organism that replicates itself every 10 minutes and spreads itself out across the world geographically it would survive a nuclear attack with the cockroaches per se yeah um, that's cute <laughs> <laughs> no i i love i love bitcoin uh, cosmic I mean, cosmic cosmology right? yeah. have you ever heard the phrase that joe rogan uses a lot on his podcast and actually it's more in the stand-up 
he says we are the sex organs of machines like we just proliferate them and make them like make sure that they persist into the future and, and keep expanding and growing and it seems that way with bitcoin uh it's it, it acts a lot like dna and like rna and like replicating itself it replicates and, itself yep mm. spreads around the world are we in the matrix maybe is it about like are we in a simulation about to create another simulation with bitcoin being being the catalyst for that it's, it's blockchains all the way down <laughs> <laughs> we are a blockchain uh. <sighs> It's, it's funny to jump into those topics every once in a while. What's like the most cosmic theory that you've heard about Bitcoin? Like Satoshi is a time traveler. We t- Ooh, we talked about this when we met up. Let's talk about this. Because I've been explaining this terribly that one time we met at the Smith uh, a few months ago and you told me that Bitcoin might be a quantum computer alert <laughs> system. <laughs> <laughs> Marty, come on. That was, I think, three old fashions into a... Yeah. <laughs> Smith session. And it has to do with the the way Satoshi's coins are stored, right? In in the wallet wallet uh, setup he has, because it's not pay, pay to sit key hash. Oh yeah, yeah, that was fun. Um, because yeah, so Satoshi's coins are are all stored in pay to pub key and not pay to pub key hash. Yes. So if you can solve the discrete log problem over the sec p two five six k one curve or the DLP in general which you could do with a quantum computer, then all of Satoshi's coins are yours. So how did we get... <laughs> it's an AI that wants to incentivize humans to create quantum computers. Is that... It's incentivized to create it or it is an alarm system so we'll know exactly when quantum computing is here. Okay, that's probably it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so once Satoshi's coins move, it's like, all right, quantum computing's here. Is he the only... Is he the only person with that or entity with that type of wallet on the blockchain right now um i don't know but um the standard now is pay to public key hash which yeah. where your your outputs are protected by a hash as well as dlp which is not as susceptible to quantum quantum computing yeah there was a there was some no para was was talking about uh or somebody hopped into my mentions today asking about quantum computing and Schnorr signatures and whether it's quantum resistant, which it isn't, but... It's not, no. No. Um, are you worried about quantum computing at all? Nope. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> um, because we have... Alter- I think there are alternatives. I'm not an expert, so... Um, I don't know too much about these things, but there's an interesting thread on Bitcoin Dev from Tim Ruffing about how you could spend a paid to pub key hash in the event that there's a quantum computer in the event that quantum computers are breaking DLP without revealing your public key before spending. So the problem the problem with what happens when quantum computers suddenly come along and start breaking people's public keys into private keys is as soon as you spend your pay to pub key hash you reveal your public key so then there's then a race to get into the block so if you're fighting against a quantum computer they they take your spend they know your public key they derive your private key and they double spend you Um, but tim ruffing has a scheme where you can spend without revealing your public key and then later reveal your public key it's, it's on Bitcoin Dev. How's that possible? Uh, you should read David Harding's gist about how it's possible. Okay. Because David Harding is... Huge fan of David Harding. Oh. Very articulate writer. He's he's writing a newsletter for Bitcoin Optic, so... It's very well... If I'm going to recommend one newsletter outside of my own, Bitcoin Optic's newsletter. It's, it's, it's a pretty strong newsletter, I would say. Uh, very succinct, too. David's doing a very good job. David Harding. What a guy! <laughs> <laughs> no, you'll get you'll get an update on uh, so, some of the PRs that are the recent PRs that are out there, like uh, uh, some of the more uh, some of the more popular PRs and stuff like that, and then a little tidbit on how to become more efficient on the blockchain. It's a uh, it's a beautiful newsletter, much needed. Let, let me sell it sell right it, now to your listeners. It. Okay, hey guys, <laughs> are you a Bitcoin engineer who 
doesn't have time to keep up with IRC and Bitcoin Dev and the Bitcoin repo every week. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Spend five minutes, not even five minutes, reading the Optech weekly newsletter and you'll know exactly what's going on in Bitcoin. Whether it's pull requests, posts to the mailing list, tips for using the blockchain more efficiently, we got it all. It's uh, it's much more succinct than going to bit devs and going through eighty tabs of of PRs and uh, and Dan and uh, and uh, white papers. But John, how do I subscribe to Bitcoin Optech Newsletter? <laughs> Where do you subscribe? Thanks, Marty. Um, you subscribe at BitcoinOps.org. Go to BitcoinOps.org and sign up for our newsletter. That's BitcoinOps.org. Newsletter second tab. You got a Bitcoin ops.org slash en slash newsletters slash and it's right there they've got five out so far far um there was a lot of people mad at you guys for not for not making this public before the first four were published uh there were people really want this information it's yeah well it's it's hot information it's david harding's hot take in the week (laughs) um and we we had a few trial runs first with our with the, the companies we'd spoken to, and then we launched on Friday last week. So that's when it was all announced. Yeah, and I don't know if I spoke out of place last week. I spoke for you guys and said you were a nonprofit. Is that correct? Uh, okay, legal disclaimer, disclosure. Which one? Disclosure. Disclosure, disclaimer. Discl- disclosure. 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 Uh, we are not a not for profit legally. We are an LLC because that was easier for us to set up. But we do not exist to make a profit, and we expect to end the year with zero in our balance sheet. So any any money we get, it goes towards our costs and expenses. I think you guys should do a Bitcoin Core Devs uh, calendar. Bitcoin Core Devs calendar. To raise some money, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Who would be December? That, that, would, that would be the fodder of so much uh, B-cash FUD. Uh, December, it had to be James O'Byrne. He sort of looks like a, a svelte. Old Saint Nick, if you ask me, <laughs> with the beard, he looks like Chris Kringle in the uh, in the young uh, in the what? Uh, what is that? I mean, the timeless um, uh, doll movie. I think it's like I don't know. I forget what it is. Timeless doll movie. It's the one where you put one foot in front of the other, and soon you'll be walking through the door. Mm-hmm. I know. You don't know that one? No. And that's Marty's singing voice there, but. James O'Byrne would be December. Uh, looks the most like Chris Kringle at a young age. Let's make him grow the beard out a little bit. Uh, big CrossFit guy. <laughs> he's, he's, a, <laughs> he's a beefy Bitcoin boy. He's a be- he is part of the beefy Bitcoin boys club. Uh, I believe it's just me, him, and Mike in space right now from uh, Bitcoin Car Talk. Okay, when are you going to do a calendar? Uh, the beefy Bitcoin boys. <laughs> uh that's a great question we're gonna we're gonna talk about it that'll be brought up at our next meeting uh which is in a couple weeks we have a gigolo meet up <laughs> <laughs> uh, i kid we're getting too cosmic here we're almost an hour in again i'm selfish when i have you and other core developers in the room what else i have a question for you hit me the question that becomes the question how are you getting on with the Glass B game by Herman Hesse? <sighs> Slowly but surely. Yeah? A chapter a month. Okay, that's, that's the right speed. Yeah. You, you've got to digest it. But it is a fascinating book, just like... Because Hesse wrote that in, what, the 30s, 40s? Yeah. And him thinking 200 years in, into the future and, and how... It, it's a very cosmic book because you literally... You're you're synthesizing data with music, and it's uh, it's fascinating. Herman, H- like if for you freaks that don't know, uh, John and I bonded over love for Herman Hesse. My my annual reread is Siddhartha by uh, Herman Hesse. It's uh, if it if you have one annual reread, I would recommend it that because uh, it always it always seems to balance you out. If you're ever stressed out, that's a good book to read. It's a good book. It's a slim term, so you can. You can you can write, read it in read three it to four hours. Yeah, uh, but the Glass B game that is not a slim a, tome. It's a magnum opus. What is your favorite part about? Why is that your favorite Hesse book? Uh, it's his masterpiece. It's <laughs> um, well, you told me like if you can't get through the intro, like the most intro, people can't. The intro is yeah. I really liked it though. You like the intro? Yeah, it, it, it really sets the scene. 
Mm -hmm. it, it filters out a lot of readers who probably wouldn't appreciate it. And it really, it really makes you think about, because they talk about music in particular and how it is uh, an extension of the mental health of a society, would you say? Mm -hmm. Maybe. It, it went through like the terrible, mu I mean, at the time, like he thought the music of the 30s and 40s was bad. Like imagine if he was hearing the, the top 40 charts rap that's out there right now. He was he was big into cultural history. Was Hesse? He he was uh, very interested in looking at society through its its culture and, and music. And right. A lot of his books incorporate music. His and and education. Those are his big themes. Well, <laughs> we're gonna tie this all back to Bitcoin because <laughs> this is like what Seyfedean says a lot is is fiat money has led to fiat food has led to like the fiat culture where you're just like fickle fast let's get money let's get money i mean that's what rap is basically about get money get money get money and we don't have buildings we don't have art we don't have music like we used to there's no more beethoven's there's no more mozart's there's no more michelangelo's there's i would argue there's no more stanley kubrick's and there's no more good movies out there if i see another goddamn good godzilla or iron man movie i think i'm gonna pull my hair out uh, and he honestly believes that like a reversion to sound money would incentivize people to have lower time preference and build better buildings and make better music and focus on making a better culture at the end of the day. And he truly believes, and I'm starting to come around very much convinced that uh, Bitcoin as a sound currency could uh, enable uh, a better culture. Thoughts on that, John? <laughs> Bunk. Total bunk. Bunk? Why? <laughs> Why do you say that? I think we live in a golden age of culture and you're applying your su survival bias to things that have survived for many hundreds of years because they're good. And there were terrible things 500 years ago which didn't survive because they were rubbish. And we have good things and we have rubbish things right now and we have more good things than we ever had before. Hmm. Interesting. It's bunk. It's rubbish. <laughs> Sorry, safe. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know though. Like if you go down, so if you go down to, I, I think about architecture in particular. Okay. Because it's all cookie cutter. Is it all? Most of it is. A lot of it is, but like if you, is that not? If you go is down, that more true now than it was before. Excuse me. Is that more true today than it was fifty or a hundred years ago? I don't know. I can't say I wasn't around. Mm, me neither. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't. It doesn't. Uh, no, it doesn't seem like it. it seems like everybody. Like, you have this factory mentality applied to, like, home building in particular. So, I, when I'm envisioning this, like, I'm envisioning the short town I grew up in, South Jersey, Cape May County. And when I was there, when I was born there, it was, like, a bunch of sh short houses, like, ranchers, like, one floor. Like, nothing beautiful, nothing extensive. And it was, like, a smaller community 27 years ago. Uh, but since then... Uh, there's been like a huge housing boom on the on the island. It's just like complete shitty houses, like shitty plastic siding, shitty plastic fences. Like everyone looks the same. You go into one house that you've never been in before, you know exactly where the bathroom and all the bedrooms are because it's the same layout everywhere. It's not really authentic or or personalized at all. I would say. Yeah, that's that's a small data point. Why do you think we're in a golden age of culture? Um, because TV's really good now. Oh my gosh. Say it ain't so. The Wire. <laughs> <laughs> what a show. Uh, are The Wire Sunday still going strong? The Wire Sunday. Well, we had a little intermission and this Sunday will be the end of season one. So it's going to be a big You're not week. even done season We're one not yet? Even, we, no, we, we, we had a few weeks which we missed, but. Do you ever get sick about talking about Bitcoin? No. You know? No, do you? Uh, no, never. I'm getting sick of crypto and Bitcoin Twitter in general. It's getting exhausting. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's unhealthy. I think uh, it is. Well, Twitter is unhealthy. Yes. Yeah, I have an addiction. My name's uh, Marty Bet, and I'm addicted to Twitter. I think we did this skit last time, didn't did we? we? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it really is like it's it's a problem. Like I'm sitting there on the couch with my wife at night and I'm just like fucking phone in my face like scrolling down like it's bad like I need I need somebody to uh, I'm gonna pull a mild suitor here somebody to uh, take my account 
change my password for me and not tell me for a couple months. Mayo Suda. He's uh he's at Cash App Wahoo Wah on uh Yeah. He's has, a is he, has he been a guest? Is he He will be a guest eventually. Uh by the way, Cash App, uh this is a free ad. The best app I've I've seen to date for buying Bitcoin and getting it getting it into a wallet as quickly as possible. If you're gonna use a, a centralized exchange, I think the UX they've set up is is incredible. And Miles has been a huge part uh, on that initiative. I, th- I believe he's the the product manager of their of their crypto team there at Cash and Square. Um, and they're doing huge things for Bitcoin too. I believe they were they hosted the uh, they hosted our first Optech workshop. Yeah. So thank you, Square. Appreciate it. Yeah, Jack. Jack seems like a a Chad Maximalist. He seems bought into the to the vision. He's a maximalist. <laughs> I think. I think. Not me. And it's going to be crazy to see how they integrate uh, Bitcoin going forward. I think uh, I think they have some exciting things planned. And uh, I bet they'll be experimenting with Lightning at some point in the future as well. I hope so. Yeah. yeah. I'm not privy to any, any of that. But Neither am I. Neither am I. I, I would hope so. Should, uh, we, should we polish off this Rioja? Let's let's finish this real, huh? What do we want to What do we want to finish this podcast on, John? I don't know, Marty. It's it's always a pleasure to be to be on Tales from the Crypt, I, but I don't have any wisdom. I just I like come, I come here for the wine. <laughs> <laughs> it's getting hot in this room too. Um, you can find out more about John at John F Newberry, J F Newberry, J F Newberry. Excuse yeah. me, okay. one R. JF Newberry 1R on Twitter. Uh, go to bitcoinops.org. Uh, figure out what they're all about. Subscribe to their newsletter. Subscribe to my newsletter. And then if you have Bitcoin developer friends that are working at companies like Gemini. Oh, yeah. No, that's that's good. Yeah, I should have ended with that. Thank you, Marty. Um, if you work at a Bitcoin company and are interested in Bitcoin Optech and want to make your on-chain Bitcoin operations more efficient, Go to bitcoinops.org if you're an open source developer and would like to talk to engineers at Bitcoin companies and learn what's going on in the field in real life. Go to bitcoinops.org. Is Chenko doing any residency residency programs uh, in the future? We we got something cooking, but not announced yet. Not yet. You'll be first. You'll be the first to know. Be on the lookout. Sign up for the newsletter. We'll probably be in there. Um, that's all we got for this week. Peace and love, freaks. Bye.